Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Crowdsourcing Sustainability Podcast. This episode is thanks to the good people over at Brighter Future, who recently reached out to interview me for their origin story series, which, in their words, is about highlighting the path that planet-driven leaders walk on their journey to create a brighter future. So I had the tables turned on me in this one and had a fun convo with Sandra Govaya. I figured I'd share it for here for those of you who want to hear more about my story and some of the thinking behind crowdsourcing sustainability. And that's all I've got for you in this intro. So let's get into it. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Ryan. So first of all, thank you for accepting uh, to come here and uh, tell us a little bit more about your origin story. I would like to start by asking you if you could tell us um, a bit more about yourself and the work you do. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, so a little bit about me and the work I do. Um, the main thing to know about me really in this context is I'm a huge sustainability nerd. Um, and, you know, I've been kind of obsessed with climate change and sustainability ever since it crossed my radar, uh, which was 10 years ago in college. And ever since that time, I've been really trying to wrap my head around, like, what can I do personally to help solve this problem by changing my own life? But also, like, what can I do through work to help, you know, everyone solve this problem quicker? Because... I see it as like the greatest challenge facing humanity today. You know, again, back a lot of a lot of these big decisions for me were made back in college, but I at the time was trying to figure out like what am I going to do with my career? Uh, I want to do something meaningful if I'm going to be working 40 hours a week, like I want to like what I'm doing cuz that's a big chunk of our lives. Um and made the a promise to myself that I'd find a way to make a career out of working on climate, basically. And so that's a little context on how I came to be doing the work I'm doing. And, you know, out of college, I worked in clean technology for a few years um, and kind of felt like I could still be doing more to fulfill that promise and felt like, you know, the way that the media, the way I was hearing the media talk about climate or not talk about climate at all and the lack of conversations about climate, I just felt like there was more that I could be doing mm -hmm. and that had things I wanted to say and kind of had the feeling that I would regret not trying to do more and I had the opportunity to try to do more. And so I decided to start crowdsourcing sustainability which is now a grassroots movement building nonprofit. Um, and we're committed to reversing global heating as quickly and equitably as possible. And kind of the, the way we do that, we're, we're building the climate movement's power. We're driving cultural change and mobilizing people everywhere to accelerate the implementation of climate solutions in homes, schools, cities, companies around the world, we really believe that everyone is powerful and has something valuable to contribute to solving this problem. And that this isn't all hands on deck efforts. We're trying to empower people everywhere. And the last thing I'll say, like kind of how we do it at crowdsourcing sustainability, uh, we're doing this with a newsletter, which is read by 200,000 people in 150 plus countries our podcast and our online community. And through these programs, we're consistently informing minds, touching hearts and inspiring action. And I kind of think of it as we're helping to strengthen existing climate champions and onboarding new ones into the movement by connecting people to resources, hope, climate experts, peer organizations and each other so that, you know, the people can make the policy and investment decisions 
within their spheres of influence and make those decisions science-based and justice-centered. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted to use your voice and push this movement forward. It's very... Yeah. To empower others as well. Exactly. But in a I different kinda, way. I kind of figured, um, you know, even if it doesn't work the way I wanted to, like maybe I'd make friends and family think about this a little bit differently. Like even if it failed, quote unquote, like there could still be some impact by me raising my voice and letting other people know that I cared about this thing. And therefore the name crowdsorting sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is, you know, crowdsourcing a lot of people together can accomplish things that no one person would would be able to do alone. Kind of like the sum is greater than the parts. And if all of us put our heads together and contribute our unique ideas, skills, experiences, networks, that we can do something together that is uh, really what the climate crisis requires. Kind of multiply our collective impact. Thank you, Ryan. And um, so also talking a bit more about yourself, what are your roots? So can you tell us a bit more about your roots? My roots? I can. Can you, what do you mean by that specifically? Like, do you have something in mind? So you said that when you started working, um, so what did you study and how did you come to um in the sustainability area. So how did all did all did it all begin? And also roots in terms of the past. So what led you to really want to make this um take this step and really found like start this movement? So what was in it? it what, yeah. what is it what was in you? Yeah. I'll share a couple different things here. One thing that comes to mind is my mom and grandmother i think instilled a deep appreciation for nature they're both big into gardening and also really big into like birds and i also have uh kind of my grandfather and just family in general they would never have called it sustainability but they didn't like to waste anything like kind of reuse and repurpose stuff as much as possible And I'll I'll say another family-related root sort of value coming to mind is from my grandmother, dad, just like treating absolutely everyone with respect and kindness, no matter who they are, and like seeing the value in everybody. And so I think those are really important in shaping this. I'll fast forward to to college and kind of what I was saying, like, you know, I was I was in the business school when I was 20. Uh, yeah, 2021 was when they really started to, climate started to get on my radar. So I was in the business school. I had like an internship that I didn't really care for. Um, and I was like, I need to figure out what I'm doing something that's meaningful. And then climate crossed my radar for the first time when I was like 21. And I kind of had the moment of like, you know, oh my gosh, is this real? Why isn't everyone talking about it? Why aren't we doing more about this? Uh, And, you know, after going down the rabbit hole of research, realizing it is real, (laughs) kind of starting to connect the dots of what that means for the future and i kind of quick quickly grasped onto this idea that if we get climate wrong nothing else is going to be right because climate is the context in which everything else that we care about takes place uh and is really i think of it as sort of foundational to the building blocks of society so you know food water, a safe place to live, all of those are dependent on a stable climate and stable ecosystems. 
And if we heated the planet by too much, that would start to unravel. And I ultimately connected that to, it was kind of a moment for me of thinking everything was getting better and better and better in society to seeing like, oh, if we don't fix this, like stuff's going to get really bad for a whole lot of people. And so it kind of, in my head, clicked that this was super, super important to solve this problem in time uh, and that I thought it was going to be the best way possible to help save and improve as many lives as possible. Like that, this kind of became the work where it was about improving people's well-being and kind of protecting life and ecosystems. So I hope that answers the question somewhat. <laughs> it does, it does. Especially this last sentence that you said, protecting life and ecosystems. It's a very strong message. Yeah. yeah. And you just mentioned you had this aha moment uh, when you were 21. Have you experienced any more aha moments ever since in this journey of yours? I don't know. I don't think any were would be like as big as that first one, because I think once you wrap your head around the climate crisis and truly kind of look it in the eye, once you face it, uh, at least I couldn't turn away fully mm -hmm. or like I couldn't unsee it. Uh, and I think it's, it is easy for us to ignore it and not look at it, but I couldn't, look away for too long like i think part of it's that we all have a defense mechanism to like not stare it in the face because doing that all the time would be bad for our health but i had i feel like i had this thing where it's like my mind kept turning back to it and i was like i can't ignore this uh issue i'm gonna have to do something about it that kind of incorporates working on it so i will have peace in my mind <laughs> Um, but I would say one other less, not so much an aha moment, but increasing my understanding over time of this issue was, you know, in the first year or two, I didn't fully understand how close it was to us in place and time. Um, I didn't understand it was already affecting people's lives around the world, especially in the most affected countries, the lower income countries, especially people relying on the weather for their jobs and their food and their water so directly. And so that it happening now was not immediately apparent to me 10 years ago. And I think something else really important to understand about it is uh, there's a there like there's a massive justice component and there's so much to that, like how we solve it really matters and making sure um, that we kind of maximize justice. And a big piece of that in my mind is not only how you do it, but how quickly you do it, like how quickly we solve this really, really matters a lot. Um, so this isn't entirely true, but in some sense, speed is justice when it comes to climate like how quickly we can solve this is going to impact and improve the lives of a hell of a lot of people so yeah those are maybe not ahas but like you know increasing my understanding of what's going on over time and understanding of the problem this awareness that's been yeah so with with crowdsourcing sustainability and also you yourself so who do you, are you talking to directly like to everyone what do you have like a specific type of audience or people that you talk to directly people who are more aware people who are less aware who are these people yeah so the way i think of it is we're really speaking to the people who care about climate already uh it's definitely geared for the folks who are concerned or alarmed about this. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and, you know, letting them know that they're right to feel that way, like kind of validating whatever you're feeling emotionally is a natural response to such a threat to our way of life. Um, and trying to help them navigate their climate journey, the emotions, and very specifically what you can do about it. That's going to make a difference. What can you do in your home? What can you do in your city or your town or your company or your school? These kind of greater spheres of influence are even more impactful if you can organize and and change something that's bigger than than yourself. So yeah, it, it is really more focused on those who care and kind of for perspective in the US, I want to say it's it's either it's like 51 or 60%. I know those are two random numbers, but it's it changes every year based on the the survey. But something like 59 or 60 percent, I believe, of people in the US are either concerned or alarmed about climate change. And that's kind of the the that chunk of people who are who we're talking to. But it is written in a way where anyone I would hope can read it. Like it's very simple. It's very um I, I'd like to think approachable. Like I'm we're not trying to shame anyone or guilt anyone about where they're at. We don't think that's productive or useful. And I don't think it's good to blame people for existing in a broken system. <laughs> um, so I hope, I hope anyone can pick it up and it'll be interesting and useful, but it is specifically um, written for the people who care and want to do more. And it's written from the heart, like I mentioned before. <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank you. And what part of your work is the most fulfilling so if this work you do what fulfills you the most yeah it's honestly the people so and there's like a couple levels to that like there's all the amazing people who read the newsletter or listen to the podcast or are in our online community and i absolutely love talking to them and hearing from them and hearing the stories of the work they're doing. Like there are so many people doing such incredible work and I'm always uplifted and get more hope when I hear what everyone's doing. It's incredibly fulfilling to hear how CS has impacted people's work or inspired them, uh, to go from doing nothing or being in a place of like despair or depression and turning that into activism. This, yeah. So people's stories, I would say are the most fulfilling because especially at the beginning of this, uh, when we weren't, I wasn't writing to that many people for the first like year plus. And so whenever a story, whenever the first story came in and I don't know if that, how many months in that was, but I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm not just, writing into the book like you know it's all online so you write something you send it you see that it goes to all these people you see that all these people open it but i never know what people do with it unless they tell me um and you know we've done more surveys since the early days and all that but when the stories started coming in i was like there's something working here uh, and that's incredibly fulfilling to know that people are really resonating with this work and, you know, bringing it into the world in a way that's really powerful. The other thing I'll say, again, people related, but like we have a fantastic team at Crowdsourcing Sustainability. It's now me, Rachel Taylor, who is our full-time community weaver. We have an amazing person helping us with fundraising, Julia down in Brazil, podcast and video editor, Diego, and Emily Elliott is a, a student at Stanford and she's helping with social media and web development. So the, the team is fantastic. A bunch of young people, super passionate, super kind, and also just like the people that 
I get to talk to on the podcast and learn from. And, you know, part of my job is just kind of following my curiosity on (laughs) climate and what people can do. And so I get to learn constantly from all these super smart people who are doing amazing things. And uh, that's also fulfilling. And is there any particular person it or it could be any also a type of media a book or you read or a movie you watched that really truly inspired you or something like when I just mentioned this what's the first person or thing that comes to your mind yeah so I really couldn't tell you much about what's in this movie anymore but I know that an inconvenient truth that documentary from like 15 years ago Al Gore made it that was one of the first things I watched on climate and that kind of helped me wrap my head around how big and important this was some other things that come to mind are really more like quotes and there's one from the Dalai Lama that is about I think it's titled like the true meaning of life or something but my main takeaway from it is like we only have a short amount of time and one of the most meaningful things you can do is contributing to other people's happiness and I kind of equate that to well-being when I think think about it through the lens of work and a Carl Sagan quote he has a pale blue dot quote kind of putting our tiny little earth in perspective of the greater universe and how there should be more love on the planet as part of that quote. It's fantastic. I'm not going to be able to think of it all. It's it's a pretty long one. <laughs> but pale, the pale blue dot is what it's called. And then uh, one last one that comes to mind quote wise is Margaret Mead. And she has some quote about never doubting that a small group of committed people can change the world because it's the only thing that ever has. So those have been really powerful uh, for me. And I also do have lists that I've published of my favorite books that are about climate and sustainability, as well as like newsletters and podcasts. So if, and documentaries, so if people are interested in that, we can, I can definitely shoot those links over. Thank you, Ryan. And now talked about what fulfills you. Now, what are the biggest challenges you have come across in this journey of yours? So I have two things immediately coming to mind. One is just like having to learn how to do everything (laughs) that you have to do in a startup. Um, Like all the hats, you got to figure it all out. So that's a challenge. And one of them specifically that comes to mind is managing people. Because like I had worked in a corporation for a few years out of school, but I never managed anyone. Mm -hmm. And I started to manage, you know, volunteers or interns uh, early on in crowdsourcing sustainability. So I've been doing it for five years now. And there's definitely a learning curve and I bit off more than I could chew uh, more than once. Like there was one summer where I brought on eight interns and looking back, I'm like, what was I thinking? All absolutely amazing people and they deserved better than me because I did not have my act together in terms of like having enough work for everyone or defining that work and people's roles clearly enough. There's a, and you know, I'm constantly trying to get better at everything, but that's, that's a big one for me. Like how can I be a better leader internally to the team? Cause I think I treat everyone with respect, like absolutely. But there's certain things where like I could have made their contributions more meaningful and more like clear so that they would have less stress in their day as to like 
what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what's coming to mind from like three years ago, maybe. Uh, I'm still a work in progress, but I like to think I'm getting better. Everybody and then, is. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the other challenge that comes to mind uh, was more in the first two or so years uh, around just like, you know, growth was really, really slow at the beginning. And I was not making any money. Money's still a struggle, but like I've been doing this since the end of 2017 or beginning of 2018, depending on how you want to look at it. And uh, I've lived at home for every year except one since this started. So I could make make it possible financially. And especially in the first couple of years, like not knowing if this was going to work, you know, there weren't that many people reading it. I had all sorts of people close to me trying to get me to check out this job or look at this job or like, you know, trying to get me to do something else. And so it was definitely challenging to kind of keep the faith and persevere and hold on to the that idea that this was going to work and that there was something here based on what I was hearing from some of the readers and the impact it was having. Aside from the feedback you got from the early readers, what was it in you that gave you this faith that you could really make this, that you could really get as many people as you have now paying attention to the work that you're doing? So yeah. what gave you that faith? Well, I guess I'll start by saying I'm still surprised by how many people there are. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, there's 200,000 people. Like what? This is amazing. How did this happen? I I think it was more, I don't know if it was like maybe there was some level of stubbornness, <laughs> but but it really, I think a big piece of it was just like, this is important work and there aren't nearly enough people talking about this stuff. Uh, and especially like part of the reason that I started this was because like I mentioned, mainstream media wasn't talking about this enough, but also when they did talk about it, it wasn't particularly helpful in my opinion. So like there's a lot of fear and doom and gloom and not really giving people actions that were kind of commensurate with the scale of the problem. Like, you know, the sky is falling, make sure you recycle. And so I kind of just felt the, the sort of way that I was talking about it in the newsletter was really important for people to hear. And just really quickly, I'll give a sense of how we do talk about it in case that's helpful. So the newsletter is called crowdsourcing sustainability newsletter. Like that's what it's called now. When it initially came out, the org was still called crowdsourcing sustainability. That's always been the case, but the newsletter was called what on earth and earth was actually an acronym. So it had five sections. The E stood for something exciting. The A was something alarming. The R was a random quote. T was take sustainable action. And H was highlight highlighting someone awesome. And so I kind of had this sandwich of like, the A was always in there. Like, here's the scary thing that you need to know to increase your understanding of what's happening and going on. But there's also exciting stuff happening. The quote was always kind of inspirational or make you think deeply. And then giving people an action and showing them someone who's doing amazing work. I felt like that sort of recipe really helped to keep people engaged and looking at the topic and letting them know, like kind of providing over time a menu of actions you can take, like whatever is going to work for you. There's all sorts of things you can do. So yeah, I I, I kind of think I trusted my gut and that this was needed right now. And it 
seemed like it was very balanced because there's a lot of people uh, out there struggling with echo anxiety. Um, and so you do need this uh, boost as well of exciting news and what's happening out there. It's yeah. Sometimes the media can also be too negative um, mm -hmm. when explaining a situation that's happening. Absolutely. And I think you touched on one other thing that I haven't really yet, which I think is super important, which is, you know, we're not conventional media by any means. And I think that allows us to instill some level of emotion and personality and authenticity. And I think people really need emotion in the communications around climate. Like there needs to be some acknowledgement about how serious this is and how hard of an issue this is and kind of validating the emotions are and helping people work through them is really important into actually increasing action on this thing and increasing well-being and sustained action because it's it's easy to be overwhelmed by this issue because at the end of the day we're humans right yes <laughs> Okay, and so this question I want to ask right now is what future are you envisioning, envisioning to create with the work that you're doing? So what do you hope help create with TS? So we like to talk about it as creating a world that is safe, healthy, and just. For everybody. Mm -hmm. I can share some like specifics of what I envision. And you know, this is this is actually one of the things that we've crowdsourced. So I've, you know, included ideas from all sorts of different people, but of course it's it's still just one vision. But you know, it it part of it is just the basics of like a future where the water is clean <laughs> and safe to drink. And the air is not polluted by all the burning of fossil fuels that we do right now. There was actually a study from Lancet and maybe there was another organization. I don't know if it was the World Health Organization or not, but like, you know, just another air pollution study that has come out saying that it was like 99.9% .9 of the world's population breathes air that isn't safe to breathe. Like, I think we often take for granted how harmful our current systems are. And so, you know, clean water, clean air. And I imagine cities that have way less cars in them and more public space, more nature integrated into everything. Hand in hand with fewer cars, more public space means more like community, like people having more social connections than we do right now. We've also lost a lot of community over the decades. I I could I could go on and on, but I, I also want to mention that I wrote about this recently, like kind of supply chain justice, but also really taking a look at just the entire economic system that we've created and how currently it prioritizes profit over people on the planet. And so I envision a future where the opposite is true. Like we prioritize people and the planet, ecosystems, other life on earth, other beings over money. And so I am envisioning all sorts of kind of leveling up our values or maybe not, I don't know if leveling up is the right word, but integrating them into our systems because right now like they're not really reflected in our in our systems yeah and also kind of seeing ourselves as a part of nature instead of separate from and better than it and i think if we if we do those things there's all sorts of ripple effects that'll make people's lives better and will make the world more just and safe and healthy on the mental aspects. Yeah. Now, how would you like your friends and family 
to look back upon your journey. So how would you like them to think of you? Lovingly? <laughs> <laughs> Fondly? I don't know. Uh, I definitely want to create as many memories as possible with people I love that are meaningful. And what legacy do you want to leave behind you? Legacy, that's a big word. <laughs> I I don't know. I uh I just kind of think of it as I'm trying to do my best and I hope other people do the same cuz I think if if when enough of us step up and try to make things better, they're going to get better. So sort of leading by example, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what advice would you give uh, a young entrepreneur who wants to start working in the climate space? What advice would you give to this, this person? Yeah. the I mean, what, what comes to mind immediately is really might seem silly because it's so basic in a way, but like being kind to everyone. I don't think that can be like understated. Like it's, I, I think that's absolutely critical um, to be kind to everyone, to value people, uh, assuming positive intent. That's something I learned from one of my first bosses and has really stuck with me um, in terms of helping to communicate more effectively or like, even in day-to-day -day life, this might be a weird example, but like if someone, if you're driving and someone cuts you off, like it's kind of just much nicer to assume that they are on their way to the hospital or like, you know, they're about to, yeah, on the way to the hospital to have a baby um, instead of like someone, like they needed to to do that. And I think, Assuming positive intent just kind of helps with relationships and working together in your own peace of mind. I'll also say celebrating the wins and appreciating how far you've come and not always only looking at the future and how far you have to go. That definitely makes a difference. And I've learned that a bit late. Assuming that things are going to take like twice as long as you think they're going to take that might also help with peace of mind and being authentic, I think is hugely important as well as being really, really intentional with who you surround yourself with uh, in terms of teammates, especially, but also just partners and who your community is. And now um... If there was one lasting message that you could share with the world, what would it be? This is this is where I'd much I'd rather write this so I can get it right <laughs> instead of just you know all rambly. But I I would say that you know this really is the greatest challenge of our time, and it is scary, but it's also a huge opportunity for us to make the world better. I mean, like I said, we're living in a very broken, dysfunctional, harmful system, even if we don't stop to think about it that way too much, or if some people don't, um, there's plenty that know this in their bones through daily experience that it's broken and not fair. Um, but there's an opportunity right now because we do need to change everything and we are seeing how broken it is. Like this is like, things are going to change no matter what. And it's still in our power to choose how that change is going to look like what the future is going to be. And everyone has way more power than they think. Um, 
like whoever is listening to this or reading this, like you are powerful. What you do and what you say and what you think, this all like ripples through your network and the places you belong to. And, you know, if you change your home, your neighbors take notice. If you change uh, how your school or company operates and make those places climate positive, like the companies in that industry are going to be like, oh, what are they doing? We're going to have to, you know, keep up with the Joneses or the school is going to do the same thing or the town or the city. And so, yeah, I just want to emphasize that everyone has a lot of power and it's multiplied when you organize and work together with other people. And there's also a whole lot of meaning when you work on these things with other people. There's a sense of community and purpose that I think is kind of lacking in society right now. Um, so doing this kind of work is good on on so many levels. Yeah, you know, this, like I said, there's a there's a vast difference between the best and worst case scenarios. And so much of this is still in our control. And what you do is going to make a hell of a lot of a difference. And if we're going to build the safe, healthy, and just world that we want to, it's going to be because people uh, like you and me and anyone reading or listening, people like that stepped up. Thank you very much, Ryan. <laughs> that was a powerful message. <laughs> so I am done with questioning you. <laughs> I'm off the hot seat. Yes, you can. <laughs> That's a really good interview. So on behalf of the whole Brighter Future team, I really want to thank you um, for sharing your story with us and sharing such great insights and wisdom, uh, which I'm sure um, people who are also reading the origin story or listening to the podcast, they will take a lot from it. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are welcome. Thank you for doing this work. This is much needed. <laughs>